Welcome everybody to Time Me Up for Life, Chapter 7. Um, we're talking about Klippat Noga now, um, about this part of evil that has good within it, just like the, the nut um, has a shell that surrounds it, um, but within it is the, the, the fruit, the good. Um, that's the same as Klippat Noga, that there is essentially good within it, and if there's a big covering of darkness. That's what it is. That's it. That all things that are not performed for the sake of heaven, like eating food. Oh, my internet connection is unstable. I'm going to have to take this away. <laughs> Um, like eating food. When we eat food, we should be eating for the purpose of a myth. Eating for the purpose of connecting with our God. Um, um, and when we're conducting business, we should be doing business in order to have um, the, the money and the funds to be able to give our children a Torah education in order to um, have guests over, share goodness into the world, shed light and spread light. Um, so when we're, when we're earning money, when we're doing all these things, we're doing it for the sake of God. We're not doing it for our own sake. Um, the same way that when I'm you know, careful with what I'm eating, when I'm taking care of my body, when I'm exercising, I'm doing it l'shem shamayim. I'm doing it for God, um, a godly purpose, not just my own self-serving reasons. Um, and what's this godly purpose that I can connect my mind to <coughs> when I'm doing things in line with this is, you know, my, my body is a temple. It, um, it's, the, our sages have connected our body to the Beit HaMikdash, <clears throat> the temple of old. And our neshama, our soul, is the divine presence that's dwelling within it. Um, so even though we don't have a Beit HaMikdash today, which we learn um, and we know that the, per, the point of the Beit HaMikdash was that it was a home. Hashem told the Jews to build a home for me in the world build a home for me in the desert and then in um, Jerusalem. That meant that his presence would come in more than anywhere. It would be present um, in this focused con condensed place. And through that concentration of, you know, absolute infinity, um, it was able to be shared with the world around it. So we have that ability today. Unfortunately, we don't have the, the, the base of Mikdash with us still standing physically. But we have our base mikdash that's with us constantly all the time. And Hashem gave that to us in the form of a body. So we have this body. We have this base mikdash, a mishkan. And we learned that there's a part of ourselves that's directly connected to the king, that's directly connected with the shechina, with Hashem. So for him, for us to take care of our bodies, you know, build a temple for God to dwell in, <laughs> means take care of your body so your neshama can shine through it. Means be healthy with your body. You don't want to um, forsake sleep. You don't want to forsake um, eating the right foods for yourself that won't cause you inflammation or pain or anxiety or whatever it is, foggy brain. You want to eat things that will nourish you and nurture you and make you a good um, dwelling place for God. Because if you're not feeling great, if you're not very fit enough for your own personal health then you're not shining godliness into the world it's 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 from my own experience it's a very self-absorbed existence um if you can't um if your your mind is so um drawn to all the 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 things that are not actually helping you because then you can't be approachable for other people you can't be kind to other people and use all your gifts to share um, instead, you're focusing more on self-serving, pleasure-seeking, and then dealing with the consequences. <laughs> so, so this is this is what we've learned in terms of actions, in terms of words and thoughts. It should all be directed to the service of Hashem, because if it's not directed to the service of Hashem, 
the it will be turned towards the other endeavors so it will turn to the service of your own will your own desire and the own, your own lust of the body um in the body in the way that it's not a temple to god in the way that it becomes um that the clipper within it the 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 evil that exists that it comes from will be more revealed and it won't be a temple for god so that your your neshama will not be shining through it will be buried um even this comes like we learned before um where it's a necessary bodily function where the body needs to do it in order to preserve its life such as eating which we talked about it needs it for it to be able to exist um and even breathing and even going to the bathroom and all these things it's everything um, that we have the ability to create ourselves as a dwelling place for god in this very moment no matter what we're doing um <clears throat> Thus, the act itself, such as breathing or sleeping or eating or going to the bathroom, these things are not bad. So they can't be faulted. The fault, uh, you know, of, of not um, elevating this place and making your, um, yourself a, a dwelling place for God, um, it lies in your intention, which is not for the sake of heaven, i.e., not utilizing your body as an instrument in the service of God. So if this spiritual intent is absent, then all these acts, utterances, and thoughts are no better than the vitalizing animal soul itself. And everything in this totality of things, i.e. the soul with its actions, its speech, and thoughts, flows and is drawn from the second gradation of klipot and sitra achra, which is in the progressively ascending order of Klippa, the fourth Klippa called Klippa Noga. Klippa that shines, for within this Klippa there is yet found a ray of holiness. In this world, called the world of Asiya, action, most, indeed almost all of the Klippa Noga is evil, with only a little bit of good intermingled within it. Klippa Naga is found in the higher world as well. However, the proportions of good and evil which comprise it vary from one world to the next. In Bria, the, the higher world, Klippa Naga is mostly good, possessing only a small measure of evil, which is separate from the good. In Yitzira, which is the next world under it, it is composed equally of good and evil, while in Asiya, the lowest world, our physical world, Klippat Naga is almost totally evil, with only a minute representation of good and light. From this minute amount of good within Klippat Naga come the good qualities which are found in the animal soul of the Jew, as explained above. Um, as explained in the first chapter, the Jew's inherent qualities of compassion and benevolence stem from his animal soul. This is a soul of Klippa, yet because its origins are in Klippa Noga, which incorporates good as well, it gives rise to the good traits of compassion and benevolence. Since Klippa Noga is a mixture of good and evil, any action, utterance, and thought emanating from this Klippa can be utilized for good or for evil. Indeed, as the Alter Rebbe will explain presently, the very same action, speech, or thought may be holy if done for the sake of heaven or evil if otherwise intended. Now Klippa Naga is an intermediate category between the three completely unclean Klippot and the category and order of sanctity. Hence it is sometimes absorbed within the three unclean Klippot and at other times it is absorbed in and elevated to the category and level of sanctity. That is, it is absorbed within sanctity when the good that is intermingled in it is extracted and separated from the evil. It prevails over it and it ascends to be absorbed in sanctity. The Alter Rebbe now provides an example of the neutral action or utterance that is derived from Klippat Noga and can thus be utilized for either good or evil, demonstrating how the action or word itself 
becomes holy when its motivation is for the sake of heaven and how it is degraded to the level of the three completely unclean pot, clip pot if prompted purely by physical desire. For instance, if one eats fat beef and drinks spiced wine, not out of the physical desire, but in order to broaden his mind for the service of God and for his Torah. As Rava says, wine and fragrance make my mind more receptive. Or another example is in order to fulfill the commandment to enjoy the Shabbos and the festivals. In the latter case, his eating and drinking are not merely the means to a spiritual end, as in the previous example, but are a mitzvah in themselves. For we are enjoined to enjoy the Shabbat and festivals through eating meat and drinking wine. When one eats and drinks in the above mentioned manner, then the vitality that is within the meat and the wine, which originates from Klippat Noga, is then extracted from evil and it ascends to God like a burnt offering and sacrifice, i.e. the life force of Klippat Noga that the food and drink contain is absorbed in sanctity. So too concerning speech. The vitality of words spoken for a sacred purpose ascends as is absorbed in sanctity. For example, he who makes a humorous remark to sharpen his mind and make his heart rejoice in God and his Torah and his service, which should be practiced joyfully, as Rava was wont to do with his pupils, prefacing his discourse with a humorous remark, whereupon the students became cheerful and thereby more receptive and better able to understand the discourse. When a humorous remark is made with this intent, the vitality of the words which originates in Klippat Noga is extracted from the evil of Klippat Noga and is absorbed instead in sanctity. On the other hand, if a person is one of those who gluttonously eat meat and quaff wine in order to satisfy their bodily appetites and animal soul, then since of the animal soul's four elements, this desire belongs to the element of water from which comes the appetite for pleasures. As explained in the first chapter, all evil characteristics come from the four evil elements of the animal soul with the appetite for pleasure emanating from the element of water. In such case, the vitality of the meat and wine that he ingested is thereby degraded and absorbed temporarily in the utter evil of the three unclean clipots. His body becomes a garment and a vehicle for these clipots. The term vehicle is an analogy for total subservience. Just as a vehicle is completely subservient to the will of its driver, having no will of its own, so too in this case is the gluttonous person totally subservient to the three unclean clip pots. But his body remains so only temporarily until the person repents and returns to the service of God in his Torah, whereupon he ceases to be a vehicle for the clip pot. The energy of the food and drink is then released from the clip pot and returns to sanctity. For inasmuch as the meat and wine were kosher and permissible, and it was only the person's desire for pleasure that degraded those things, the meat and the wine, they have the power to revert and ascend with him when he repents and returns to the service of God, at which time the strength that he gained from the food and drink are utilized in serving God. Wow, this is amazing, 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 amazing. I don't even know if there's anything for me to explain. Um, I think it's phenomenal. Basically, what it's telling us is through our um, interaction with this lowly world that we live in, a broken world, a world where it's ruled by the Kripa, ruled by evil, <coughs> Hashem has created us as co-creators, co-partners, that we have the ability to not just elevate ourselves, um, because we learned before in chapter one that we're all on different levels. Some of us are at the lowest of the low, that we have no desire to repent, no connection to our, no sensitivity to a pure um, altruistic desire to connect with God. Some people have none of this and they continue doing what they're doing, like without caring. Um, the other people have 
a, a, a sensitivity to it after they've done something um, self, you know, only self-pleasing, self-satisfying, then they realize, oh, I've been so self-absorbed and I feel horrible. And then they want to repent and turn back. Teshuva in itself, it's amazing that the meaning of teshuva, which is repenting and saying sorry, you know, trying to, um, you know, be accountable for what you've done and turn to God um, and ask for help to, to, to go back and, you know, you don't want to do it again. And um, um, that whole process is, you know, and saying, sorry, please forgive me. Well, that whole process is called teshuva. Teshuva, when it's translated, means returning. Who are you returning to? You're returning to your true self. And I think that's amazing here because very often it's so easy um, for me to turn back to, not to turn back, but to, to keep going in a way that I think um, is right, but is actually not the true me. It's not coming from my true self. So things like self-affliction, things like depression, oh, a heavy burden, you know, pressure, trying to, to work out all the answers, trying to have control over situations, um, trying to help people in their healing process and trying to give them everything that they need, give them all the answers. That's not my control. That's not who I am. I am, um, I'm just a vessel for God. I am just a mikdash melech. I have a piece of him. And through, um, through me working on unveiling myself, getting rid of all these clippers that we're seeing, I'm able to shine myself up and be a, a metal, a pure metal, to be a great superconductor for the electricity coming from God. So that, and this is what Miriam says, that we need to focus on being a superconductor for God. Because depending on how clean the metal is, then the electricity can come in full force, in full flow, and be transmitted. Or if there's lots of blockages, lots of clip bots covering it um, in the way, then this superconductor, this metal rod, which is me, um, gets dulled out. It's not so sensitive. It can't pick up on all the light that's coming through it. Um, so Hashem's always giving us the Shem's always giving us, um, and we have the ability to, to, to receive it all for as much as we can. We can always grow to get more, but it's all dependent on how many blockages I have and how clean my vessel is, how big my vessel is. So we really have the opportunity and learning this in chapter seven, seeing that what are these sort of things that can put blockages in my pure metal and how do I... Um, get rid of it how do I you know clean it clean my my metal and make it shine so that I can just be um, a dwelling place for God in this world and share the goodness and share these holy emotions and have the wherewithal to withstand um, all the difficulties that are coming my way <coughs> because it's not possible without God definitely not possible um, so Basically, what we're learning is um, all things that come from Klippa, Klippat Naga, if we indulge in it, if we indulge in it in the wrong way, and we engage in it in the thoughts, in the speech, or in the actions, or in objects that it are in, the, in a way that's self-pleasing, or at least even if it's not self-pleasing, if it's not directed to godly service, then it will cause a barrier to be on me. It will cause a blockage in my metal rod. And um, over time, many people um, will have built up heart walls that it's hard for them to trust anybody. It's hard to be vulnerable. Um, even davening is difficult because, you know, taking accountability for all the things that they've done wrong. They feel like they're being judged and all these things. But all these things get in, 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 um, in the way of you expressing who you really are. And it gets in the way of your relationships. It gets in the way of um, the love that's really there and all the good feelings that's really there. And why is that? Because the way Klippa works is if you've connected it to a holy purpose, then the Klippa 
will change, the good will be taken up, the clipper will be taken up like a holy sacrifice, right? If you've used it for the bad, right? And, you know, the bad or mundane, self-indulgent, whatever it is, something that's not for the sake of God, then what naturally happens is um, that the evil within it will um, grow around the goodness that's essentially always there within Klippat Noga, right? And it'll cover it. So knowing the, that's the, the, the formula, that's the law of nature, the way the world is created, that all things Klippa, all things around us, this is the way that, that um, we create the spiritual vibes, this is the way we create energy, this is the, what happens. Then take that a little step further and understand, wow, my animal soul is Klippa Noka. It is this source. It is part of this um, formula. So I know that if I um, engage in thought, speech, interaction in a way that's um, not L'Shem Shemayim, <clears throat> then I automatically know <clears throat> through this teachings that I'm covering and burying my soul. I'm burying the goodness that's there. I'm burying my true self, right? So the more layers I've buried with, like the more thoughts that I've partake, taken in, which are not L'Shem Shemaim, the more actions, TV that I'm watching, that's not L'Shem Shemaim, the more um, food that I'm eating, that's not L'Shem Shemaim, um, you know, whatever it is, everything that I'm doing that is not L'Shem Shemaim, they're just adding on more um, barrier, barriers, more... Um, um, obstacles, right? It's just the clipper. It's not a bad thing. This is the nature, our nature. So um, what we could do instead is when we engage in these things around us, thought, speech, and action, then we can have, a, we can do it l'shem shemaim for a godly purpose. And through just doing that one thing, we're elevating our animal soul because the thought, speech of actions of our animal soul is klippa. So klippa noga, which means the good is there. All we have to do is elevate it. And it's a small amount of little, a little bit of good. It's not a lot, but that just goes to show you a little bit of light banishes times of darkness and it takes it all up to, to God. We become more elevated. We become a shinier vessel that can hold more light. Um, and we learned here a little bit, and I think we'll go into it more, that once we've gotten all these um, barriers on our heart, barriers on our animal soul, buried ourselves, we buried ourselves under layers and layers of kupa, layers and layers of thinking, speaking, doing things not for the sake of God, then how are we supposed to uncover ourselves? You know, I remember for myself, like, you can be so in traumatizing pain that everything somebody says every look that they give is it, it all has to do with you and it all um makes you feel it makes you react either you know dive into yourself much more go into escapisms and resent hold resentments against the person or you, you can attack the person and it can come out and it's just no peace it's the opposite of peace this is just a symptom of this buried heart, of this buried this buried soul. It's just the animal soul that has has been used for so much negative, you know, opposite of holiness that it's buried. And all you have to do is uncover it. And Hashem has given us the tools. You know, Hashem doesn't give you something that you can't handle. He gives you nature and he teaches you how to deal with it, even how to transcend it. Baruch Hashem, that's what the Torah is here for. So. What we do is we do tshuva. When we do tshuva, the whole thing is you're returning back to who you really are, back to your inner essence that's buried underneath and you're redeeming your soul, you're redeeming it. Um, and layer by layer, you're like getting rid of it all. Um, and that's why Miriam says, and the Rebbe, the Rebbe teaches that it's very important for us to do shema 
at, at night. Before we go to sleep, in the Chabad Sidur, there's and the Safadi Sidur, there is um, the 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 prayer of um, Ashamnu Bagano. It's like confess. It's like confession, video. It's you know atonement for my sins of the day. And what that does is it goes layer by layer. It goes to the olive bit. So even if you don't remember the sins that you've done, even if you don't know what you've done that was not the shame shamayim, you're going systematically through an alphabetical order that it will pick up everything. And even more than that, there's another additional prayer that goes through the, the makeup, the, the DNA of the world, through the different names of Hashem. And it picks up, if I've done anything that has caused a disunity between the name of Hashem, then for this, I'm sorry, and I accept the punishment spiritually, and automatically those sins, you've now done your teshuva. You can be joyous as if, you know, all these sins have now become your merits because all the energy that you use while you, you ate without thinking of God, now because you've said the, the teshuva, we just learned the Alter Rebbe teaches us that it's counted as if it was um, a mitzvah, all for the service, all the shem shemaim. So even more so, imagine how much your soul will be shining through, that you won't have any barriers, your soul will be shining through. And this is an amazing process we go through every single night. We have this opportunity that we don't have to hold the stains of yesterday and wake up heavy and burdened. We can get rid of it and start fresh again. Um, and it's part of our daily prayers. Why? Because Hashem knows we're not perfect. It's so easy. Um, and he's not attacking us and he's not disappointed. It's part of it. And he does forgive us. He says so in our davening. So really, this is joyous. This is something to be so grateful for, that now we understand a little bit more about our human nature and how we can reveal and redeem our true self even through our, um, our faults that are just a part of this human nature. So, so I love that, that it's only temporary. It's not your true self. Your true self is everlasting and eternal. That's all your good traits. That, that's your neshama underneath. But when you're um, a vessel for klippa, right, when you're so buried, um, then you don't have will, your own will anymore. You can experience it with your, um, you know, if you look at somebody or if you think about your own life, has there maybe been a time where you've lost your self-control? You know, maybe it was that time when you saw that you were overeating or you're eating a lot of sugary things, sweet things, and you were telling yourself, I can stop if I want to. And then when you really try, you see that you don't, you, you, you don't have that willpower to stop yourself from taking another bite or to stop yourself from, from um, engaging in speaking gossip, you know, or, or whatever it is, or watching TV or whatever it is, you just, you, you've lost the willpower to do so. And you might judge yourself really harshly as I have in the past, but it's part of our nature. This is just, um, this is just what the, the Rebbe is telling us here, that um, once you've used your body, um, like once your animal soul has partook in um, the clipper in the wrong way, then now your entire body, your entire body becomes a vehicle for this, like the, the badness, the bad side of clipper, the clipper, um, because it didn't get, elevated to holiness. So now it's here, it's in your body, it's present, um, it's blocking you. And for this time, until you change the story, until you repent and return to your true self, for some people, it may be a day, it may be years. Some people don't say Kriyat Shama at night. And so they don't go through this process of getting rid of the klippa. Some people unfortunately live this for years, but Hashem has told us how to get rid of it and how to deal with it and the fact that it does happen so that we understand what's happening. We don't treat ourselves badly for this normal um, occurrence. So what happens is 
Our entire body is now a vehicle for it and we lose our will. It's a vehicle, which means um, it's not the driver. Our body is not the driver and we've lost the, the ability to, to drive our vessel, to drive our body where we want it to go. So this is normal, accept it, understand it, and know that um, it's normal that not only will you continue to overeat, not only will you continue to, um, I forgot what my other examples were, continue to, to speak Lashon Hara or, or you know, not have a screen on your mouth, not have a filter, not able to stop yourself, but also your emotions will become more, like more um, sensitive, more high, heightened. Um, and that one look will cause you to, to break down. Um, you'll lose your temper at your children. You'll, all these things, everything will, will take you down very easily because you're going even lower and lower and lower into the kutbot without your own will. So here the Rebbe says, you have, the, you have to know that it's temporary. It's not who you are. Even though you have no will of your own in this time, this is temporary. You have to remember who you really are and return to that place by doing Teshuvah and turning to Hashem for help. Um, okay. In as much as the meat and the wine were kosher, and permissible, and it was only the person's desire for pleasure that degraded those things, they have the power to revert and ascend with him when he returns to the service of God, at which time the strength that he gained from the food and drink are now utilized in serving God. This is implied in the terms heter, permissibility, and mutar, permissible. That which may be done or eaten is called mutar, literally meaning released or unbound. Wow. In our context, the term means that the permissible object is not chained to the clipot. That is to say, it is not tied and bound by the power of the extraneous forces, i.e. the clipa and citra afro, which are extraneous to the realm of sanctity, um, preventing it from returning and ascending to God. That's amazing. Rather, it can return and ascend to God when the person involved returns to the service of God as explained above. That's amazing. So again, Hashem created the world with the Hebrew letters. There's, uh, there's infinite knowledge. There's infinity behind these letters. And when they're put together to create words, um, you know, just like God created the world with words, then um, we can glean a lot of wisdom. Here, we're being taught of the connection between the word for permissible, permissible which is heter, coming from mutar, um, tahar. And the meaning we're being taught is released, unbound. And that's to teach us that when something is permissible for us, it means that it will release us from being bound. It will it will unchain our poor soul that has been, you know, buried under layers and layers of clipper. It will release us from this imprisonment. So all the things that are mutar for us to do, all the mitzvah that Hashem gave us out of the goodness of his heart, of his essence, of his being, not because he needs anything. It's all for us. The Torah is for us. So everything, all the mitzvahs that are mutar is for us to use it as an opportunity to redeem our soul, redeem our true self. Um, that's amazing. And in that way, we're extracting the, getting rid of the evil that's covering us and elevating ourselves to the realm of sanctity. Um, and that's ultimately the nature of holiness, the nature of the good that is within Klippa, the nature of the good essence that's within an apple, that's within 
um, you know, my, my ability to speak, there's an essential goodness that's within. Um, and that's hinted to in Noga, the word Noga, Klipat Noga, that it has inherently within it goodness, holiness. So the essence of holiness is just like a candle, Hasidus teaches us, um, a flame will always flicker upwards, always. And that's because it's always looking to reconnect with its true source, with the essence, with Hashem, Hashem's holy fire. Um, and it's the same thing with all of Anashamas. Anashamas are like a flame dying, yearning to be reunited and consumed in its true source. You know, if you see fire, it will happily blend into one. Um, it, it, won't, it won't be repelled. It'll always want to join. And that's the essence of Anashama. And that's the essence of all the, the Noga, all the, the holiness that's within Klippet Noga. Um, you know, within the table, within a book, within the computer, within my, my, my phone, within my body, within, you know, everything, everything around us. There's a holiness that's always flickering, yearning to reconnect with its source, be subsumed in God. And the only thing that's stopping it from getting there is the, the clipper around it, um, the shell. So by connecting with it in the right way, we're able to give it what it wants and give it this kindness. It's a kindness if you think about it this way. But it's like returning a lost child, a crying child who's who's been a you know feels abandoned and is missing his mummy. And you can return him to his mom. You can find um, his mom for him. Um, and how amazing that Hashem has taught us exactly how to do it. We don't have to go to the police station and say, look, I found a missing person. Go wait for for weeks or months. Um, chas v'shalom, who knows? Maybe the person, the mom doesn't have a phone. No, like there, there's so many things that can happen. But Hashem has given us the way to bring his his essence, his children back to him, and it's easy. We can do it just with the way we think. Um, I think that's phenomenal. Um, Rather, it can return and ascend to God when the person involved returns to the service of God, as is explained above. Ne so again, there's, there's never a place where, where you've gone too far and Hashem will not accept you. God will always accept you, you're his child. And once you do the returning, once you repent and you return fully to Shuvah, to your true self, to Hashem, then all the sins that you've done and all the, 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 the wrong ways that you've engaged in the world, if it's a true teshuva, then it will all be um, as if it was l'shem shaman to begin with. So it will be high. Nevertheless, even when this energy refers to sanctity through the person's return to the service of God, a trace of the evil remains in the body. Eating permissible food for bodily pleasure causes the food to descend into total evil. Subsequently, the food becomes part of the body. The repentance elevates not only the person, but also the energy of the food and drink as well. Still having become a part of the body, now there's this vestige of evil that remains. For this reason, the body must undergo the purgatory of the grave, as will be explained later. Like all heavenly punishments um, and again the reason of punishments is to purify your soul that has gone through all of this pain and all of this um, you know for us in this world it feels like pleasure it feels like pleasure to eat because I really want to um, enjoy the the smell and the taste and the flavor and I really want to um, fill myself up fill that itch you know um, scratch that itch even though it feels like pleasure here when we go up to the, the spiritual world in our truth of who we are, then we'll see that it's caused a lot of stains. It's caused us to, to be apart from Hashem. So ultimately, all these sins do leave some little trace, even if we have done teshuva. And um, going through purgatory of the grave, like after passing away, we, we go through a process of cleaning this neshama. Um, so that we can properly be absorbed with our creator. Um, 
so this purgatory of the grave is a means of spiritual purification. All remaining traces of evil energy created by eating and drinking for bodily pleasure are removed through this punishment, so-called. Um, so too, and it is a kindness. All this, this punishment is a kindness um, because it's through it that we can reconnect with our father. So too, with regard to the vitality of the drops of semen emitted from the body with animal lust by he who has not conducted himself in a holy manner during intimacy with his wife during a state of purity. That is when, when a husband and wife, when a wife is nida, that's when she's menstruating. And uh, a week after that also, there's a whole process, like a ritual process that we go through counting the days within these two weeks um, of the period and after it, we're not in contact with our husband, we're not touching him, we're not, um, you know, the, there are many, many um, um, beautiful mitzvahs around it that cause, you know, that give both people their space and doesn't allow them to, um, to uh, you know, come back in intimacy together um, so that when you come up to, it's all in preparation for mikvah, because when you go through mikvah, when you're able to immerse yourself in the womb of God through this um, holy ritual water, then you're completely purified. Your whole cycle of marriage starts again, it's renewed, and there's so much beauty, there's so much holy spiritual energy and meaning um, when you come back together again. And it's really incredible. So here it's saying that. Um, so here it's saying that even if you weren't intimate with your partner, but you emitted um, um, semen, it comes from your animal lust, and it's because you didn't conduct yourself in the proper manner. Again, proper manner is thought, speech, and action. So the animal soul, um, the clipper was, was, has covered him up so that he has no control of himself. Here too, the vitality is temporarily absorbed in the total evil of the three unclean clipper until the person repents. In the above instances, the fault lies not in the acts, which in themselves are permissible, but rather in the person's intention in doing them, acting out of regard for bodily pleasure, rather than for the sake of heaven. Such is not the case, however, with forbidden foods and illicit coition, which in as much as they are prohibited acts derive their vitality from three entirely unclean clipot. These are tied and bound by the extraneous forces, the clipot forever. Wow. Um, they, the vitality of these prohibited acts, are not elevated from the clipot until their day comes, the time when evil will totally disappear from the world. When death, i.e. the clipot called death, because they oppose godliness, which is life, will be then swallowed up, eradicated forever, as it is written in Zechariah, the prophets. And I, God, will remove the spirit of impurity from the earth. Then, when the clipot cease to exist, the sparks of holiness will of themselves be freed from them. Or, until the sinner repents in the manner presently described, in which case the sparks of holiness need not remain in the clutches of the clipot until the end of days. They may even be freed and restored to holiness when the sinner repents so earnestly that his premeditated sins become transmuted into veritable merits. This is achieved through repentance out of the love of God, coming from the depths of the heart with great love and fervor and from a soul passionately desiring to cleave to the blessed God and thirsting for God, like a parched and barren soil thirst desperately for water. Inasmuch un until now, he, until he repented, right, his soul had been in a barren wilderness and in the shadow of death, which is the Sitra Ahra, 
the source of Kutha. And his soul had been far removed from the light of the divine countenance in the greatest possible measure. He's been separated from God. Therefore, now that he repents out of love, his soul thirsts for God even more intensely than the souls of the righteous who have never sinned. Wow. The righteous tzaddik, ever close to God, is like one who always has water near at hand. His thirst is never so intense. The penitent, however, finds himself as if in a desert where the very absence of water causes his thirst to burn with greater intensity. Whereas I say to say, where penit pen penitents stand, not even the perfectly righteous can stand. Where do we learn that? In Brachot, Mesechet Brachot. For as explained earlier, the tzaddik lacks the penitent's intense yearning for God. Um, I think we'll leave it there. This is amazing. Um, whoopsies. Um, yeah, wow. So what we're learning here is, okay, on the one hand, there are things that are forbidden. Um, and the makeup of these things that are forbidden, we'll find out more in the next chapter, is from a, a level of impurity and evil, Klippa, which is um, not, we're not capable of freeing we're not capable of um joining with it and sanctifying it with our thought speech and action and that's why you know again the Torah is for us that's why Hashem made it clear for us there are things in my world which for you my dear children will hurt you these things I'm telling you are forbidden for you just like you'll just like you'll tell your children. For an adult child, it's different. For a, a, a young, you know, toddler, it's different. And in the past, and unfortunately, a lot of people today still connect with that way of seeing it, um, punishment and um, things that are forbidden. You know, like, why God, why are you doing this? Why so much pressure? Why are you expecting so much from me? Um, and look at all these punishments. It's so heavy. And unfortunately, people feel suffocated because they don't have the right relationship with their father. So just like we said in the beginning, I think in our introduction, just like a child who doesn't understand the meaning of don't touch the oven, it's too hot, it'll burn you and you'll be in pain and I don't want you to be in pain. A, child, a, a toddler is not going to get that. He only gets something that's, you know, makes him feel fear, shock. You have to, you know, raise your voice. No, we have to say, you know, get away. But you have to do it with some excitement, something that's going to make him, him um, remember, make him stop what he's doing so that he's not going to touch it. That's why, um, that's why we had these punishments you know, for, for um, I can tell you so many stories, um, for the punish, the, the, the breaking of Shabbos, for example, was that person would be liable to death. So there was this one person when they were in the Midbar, after they had the, the um, Ten Commandments, after the Jews became Jewish people, and they had the commandments to keep Shabbat, make it holy, not to, to um, desecrate it by doing work on Shabbat, Malacha. This man, he did work. He chopped down trees and he brought it, brought it in. He was doing labor on Shabbat. And immediately there was like lightning struck and hit him and he died. And it was so obvious, like he died because he was doing something forbidden. And if you look at that story, there's much more behind it. That man had actually a holy um, reason for doing that. And his neshama was a big, big tzaddik. So it must have um, gone high in the, the upper world when he returned to his maker. Um, but he did it in order to show the people that this is real. This is not funny. This is something, um, um, this is something real, you know. 
before we, we became Jews, that wouldn't have happened, but now it is happening. And I'm showing you so that you have this connection to a, a, a real sense of reality of what Hashem is telling us, teaching us. Um, and it's the same thing as for that toddler. You need something, you know, intense, strict right now in the moment that will give you shock um, because you're learning a new system. Your mind is getting used to something new. When, um, and you're also incapable of comprehending it all. Now, no one's going to be hit down, shot with a lightning bolt if you're doing something forbidden on Shabbat or whatever. We're in a different relationship with God. Our generation is a generation of Mashiach. And Mashiach is this removal of all negativity, of evil in the world, of klipot. So it's a life of eternal bliss and eternal revelation of our true self, where we won't have to work so hard um, to, to see ourselves, to share ourselves, to be happy and peaceful, to feel the brachas, to have mazal and abundance, shefa. It all will be there. And that is coming up really, really soon. It's essential to our Jewish beliefs. It's one of the tenets, one of our principles of belief that Mashiach will come. Um, so, so we've, we have grown in our relationship with God. We are now like adults, like a PhD adult. Like I can learn and learn and learn and learn and have such um, passion for Hashem, you know? And I could want to do these things because on the one hand, I understand that they're good for me. The only reason things are forbidden is for my benefit that I won't hurt myself and cover my neshama up more and bury myself chas v'shalom. But also because my father loves me, right? He cares about me so much that he wants me to, to have all the tools that I need to be okay and to thrive. And when you connect and when you witness Hashem more and more in your life, then he will, when, when you go out of your way to witness God more in your life, then he will show himself to you much more easily because he wants to be seen. He wants to be seen. And he wants to have that beautiful relationship with you. So, wow, I think there's so much beauty that, that, that we can derive from this chapter. Um, for now, let's just start our quick meditation. Invite everybody to close your eyes, rest in the beauty of the love that your father is shining upon you. Connect to this love of this unconditional father who will always be there, always present. No matter what things you've done, no matter what things you're doing still, that he gets you. And he's there for you to give you everything you need, whether it's emotional support, whether it's physical support, whether it's material things, whether it's an upgraded thinking, perspective, mind. He's given us the Torah, he's given us prayer, and he's given us an ashama that we can access all that we need and more. So imagine as you breathe in and out all the tension that can, may exist in your mind and the grooves of your brain relaxing, melting away. Imagine all the tension in your muscles, all the obstructions in your blood. All the knots everything just melting down to nothingness so that there's an ease of flow through you. As your body relaxes, your mind follows it. And as your mind relaxes, it's able to start the neural pruning process to 
to cut away all those neural pathways that are not good for you, that have not proven to be helpful in your life. These bad habits, connections, associations, imaginations, thinking patterns, behavioral patterns. Now, having absolute gratefulness for God to be putting this neural cleaning process as part of your natural system. Now you can take even more pleasure in relaxing your body more and more and more and feeling okay. Everything is happening as it needs to. I don't need to control it. It's all as Hashem has directed. Now, tense up your hands, your feet, your knees, your bum. Tense it all up and let it go. Feel that release of control. Once more, tensed. Feel all the contraction, all the negative associations, all the thoughts, speech, and actions that have been not for the sake of heaven that maybe I used my hands for, my feet for, to take me somewhere. Maybe I used my bum to sit all day and to veg out. Maybe all these things that I can think of. And even if I can't think of, letting it go and feel that absence of tension. Feel God's presence even more able to pump through you. Now, tensing up your shoulders, your back, your abs, your chest, your heart. Imagine all the tension. Your head, your facial muscles. Tense everything up. And let go. Imagine all things, thoughts, speech, and actions that have existed there. Not the shame Shemayim have now all dissipated. And Hashem's presence is more revealed within you. Once more, all those places again, heart, abs, back, neck, shoulders, head, face. Tensed up, imagine where has my mouth, where have my eyes, my ears, my brain, my shoulders been carrying the burden, my heart been holding on to all this negativity, my back carrying me into the wrong situations, the wrong perspectives, the wrong actions. My belly has been dealing with all the wrong um, process of food. And your mouth, that it's been speaking wrong in a way that's not the shame to mind. In a way that it's been eating wrong in a way that's not the shame to mind. Your eyes have been seeing, perceiving the world in a way that's not the shame to mind. It's not for life. It's been for death. It's been for destruction. Your mind, has it been used for destruction, for death? Now imagine all of this tension. Breathing out, let it all go. Saying to yourself a prayer of return to Shuvah. Hashem, please help me. I'm only human and I desire to be one with you. And I want my inner essence, my soul to be revealed, to shine through no matter what, so that I can be a vessel in this world for your light and share it with those around me so I can feel it myself 
and pass it on. So that I can withstand any tensions with a smile on my face and a true feeling of serenity and joy connecting with you, being present with you always. So please, in all the ways that I've used this body in thought, speech and action, that have been not the Shem Shemayim, that have been not sanctified. Please help me to return. Please forgive your humble servant, your child, and help me. Help me to be your vessel, to be your superconductor and to want to connect with you and to want to bring my everyday experiences to be L'Shem Shemayim. For your sake, as a father yearning for his child, for the sake of Manashama, a child yearning for his, his father, and for the sake of your children around us, who are so covered and buried that they don't even sense their true self, that they act in ways that are not dignified, that are not in line with their essence. Now with a smile on your face and feeling God's presence pumping through you even more, imagine all the barriers, the layers, of Klippa have been taken off. Imagine yourself doing Shema before bedtime, turning to Hashem, acknowledging God who's always present with you and only you 100% of the time. Imagine yourself partaking in this moment to finally give him that time as well, to thank him, to appreciate him for your day to look at the things that you did today that were not with him in mind and to absolve yourself, return to your true self underneath all of those layers of barrier and see your soul shining through for a good night's sleep and waking up early for a beautiful day present with your father. Thank you. Now, coming back into your body, this holy vessel, this holy being. Open your eyes. There we go.